This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. You're listening to Episode 38, The Sydney River McDonald's Murders. It was March 1992, and 18-year-old Derek Wood had just taken a job at McDonald's in Sydney, Nova Scotia, Canada. Derek was fortunate, since he was a high school dropout, and unemployment was over 20% that year, so many people were without work. His parents divorced when he was young and his mom moved to British Columbia. Derek was known as being the kid who was shy, quiet, and slightly out of sync with others. One time, Derek's acquaintances were hanging out with him when he was drunk, and he spoke about ending his life. He was not happy with the aimless path he was on. The winter between 1991 and 1992, Derek hung out with two friends, Darren Muse and Freeman McNeil. Darren was also 18 years old and was the youngest of four boys. With six mouths to feed, his family had little extra money, but his parents were very supportive of all their children. Like Derek Wood, Darren Muse dropped out of high school and lacked direction in life. Freeman McNeil was older at age 23. His dad committed suicide when he was young so Freeman was raised by his mother with the help of his older sisters. He had been a high school graduate. Freeman even went on to the Nova Scotia Teachers College and subsequently worked as a student teacher, where he was liked by his students and peers. He veered away from being a teacher and worked as a security officer. Derek Wood, Darren Muse, and Freeman McNeil sat around that winter in 1992 and talked about committing a robbery. When Darren Wood started working at McDonald's that spring, this plan grew into something specific and shifted into reality. Early in his new job at McDonald's, Derek started training on the day shift and found himself at the back of the building. Trucks unloaded food supplies to the employee's entrance in the basement at the back of the store. A conveyor belt ran from the employee entrance to the kitchen, but it had broken down. Derek Wood and another employee had to go to the basement to carry deliveries to the storage room. He knew that the employee door was the key to pulling off the robbery. Wood, Muse, and McNeil extensively discussed their blueprint for pulling off this heist. Wood was to leave the McDonald's basement door open after his shift. McNeil would be the driver. Muse would slip inside and watch over the kitchen, and Wood was to open the safe. They discussed having a fourth person stand outside the basement door, and if workers tried to escape, that person could knock them out with a club. Out of the three young men, only McNeil had ever been in trouble for getting into a physical altercation. He pushed a kid outside of a high school and he had been charged, convicted, and was discharged. McNeil knew where he could get a handgun. His girlfriend's father owned a twenty-two caliber pistol that he kept in a dresser drawer. The expected take for this job was between $80,000 to $200,000. The three men were ready to execute the robbery on April 20, 1992, but the fourth person who was supposed to guard the door did not show up. Everyone went to the Tim Hortons coffee shop next door to regroup. Over the next several days, they tried to find another fourth person to play lookout at the basement door, but couldn't get anyone who was up for the task. They moved forward with just the three of them. On May 6, 1992, McNeil gave Wood the 22 caliber handgun and drove him to work for his shift at McDonald's. A few hours later, McNeil picked up Muse 
and they turned onto a street off the main fairway. They both pulled on a second set of clothes over the clothing they were wearing. The men didn't want any of the evidence left behind from the regular street wear and figured they would toss the second set of clothes after they completed the robbery. It was just after midnight, and the calendar now read May 7th, 1992. The night crew was trying to finish up all their tasks and get everything prepped so the morning shift could come in and seamlessly start work. 22-year-old Donna Warren was the manager of the night shift. Donna was working at McDonald's so she could save money for law school. She had also just purchased a Toyota Tercel. The decision to part with the down payment money and take on a car loan was difficult. Donna was so committed and focused on becoming a lawyer that in addition to working full-time, she took courses on the side. She had already attained a high school degree, but took radio and TV courses at a local high school because she wanted to improve her communication skills. Donna knew these skills would be an imperative asset in the courtroom when she would one day become a defense attorney. But until she could fulfill that dream, Donna ran the night crew at McDonald's, and everyone liked her management style. That night, Donna counted all the cash from the day and placed the money into the safe. 29-year-old Neil Burroughs was one of two maintenance workers at McDonald's. The maintenance guys had overlapping shifts, with one working at 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., and the other working 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. Neil usually worked the later shift, but switched to the earlier one. He was good friends with the other maintenance employee, Jimmy Fagan. Neil had been in a car accident and hurt his back several months ago. The earlier shift was easier, since most of the work was cleaning and not as much heavy lifting. Jimmy was nice enough to switch hours with Neil. Neil was married and had one son. The pay at McDonald's was okay, but Neil's wife worked as well. Between the two of them, they could provide a good life for their son and could live close to family and friends. Neil was getting the restaurant ready for the morning crew and had been cleaning the sink after midnight on May 7th. 20-year-old Arlene McNeil was working on the last task of her shift and was taking inventory of all the food supplies. She finished the task quickly because the new cashier, Derek Wood, delayed punching out of work and stayed late to help her. Arlene had worked a little with Derek, but didn't know him well. She was grateful that he was proving to be so helpful. Even after Arlene was done, Derek wasn't in much of a hurry to leave work, it seemed. Arlene didn't mind working at McDonald's. She was saving up for college and was leaning towards getting a business degree. Arlene wrapped up her shift, punched out on the time clock, and slipped out of her uniform into her street clothes. She lingered around and waited for her friend and manager, Donna Warren, to finish up so they could walk out together. 27-year-old Jimmy Fagan was the second maintenance worker at McDonald's. Jimmy came from a large family and was one of seven siblings. His parents worked hard to provide for all their kids. His dad was a retired steel worker, and his mom was still working. Jimmy had been working at a department store a year prior, but quit when his brother offered him a job in landscaping. Unfortunately, when fall rolled around, Jimmy was not needed because the landscaping work waned. Jimmy's sister-in-law was a shift manager at McDonald's and put in a good word for him at the store. It was an excellent fit, because he could work there for the winter and then return to landscaping in the summer, since there would be plenty of college kids that were looking to work at McDonald's for summer jobs. Then when the students went back to school and the landscaping work was not available, he could be hired back at his McDonald's maintenance job. Jimmy always arrived at McDonald's well ahead of a shift. He wanted to chat with all of his night crew friends before they went home. Jimmy's friend, Daniel McVicar, drove a cab, picked Jimmy up, and gave him a ride to McDonald's. As the McDonald's night crew were hard at work, Wood, Muse, and McNeil began executing the plan. Just after 1 a.m., Wood went back to the basement door, 
stuck his bag in the door jam, and walked across the street. The three men gathered at Tim Hortons, across the way from McDonald's. Wood, Muse, and McNeil jumped into the car and parked on a road that was close by. They walked to the McDonald's and entered through the door, which was propped open by Wood's backpack. The trio walked through a dark room, with Wood wielding the handgun. Muse wore a Halloween costume mask to cover his face. His weapons of choice were knives, while McNeil brought a shovel handle and some rope. Donna Warren and Arlene McNeil were getting ready to leave and recognize Derek Wood, but were confused why he was there since his shift had ended a while ago. As the manager of the night shift, Donna had pondered what would happen if she were ever robbed. She knew the plan was to give the robbers everything they wanted, without question. Wood aimed the 22 caliber pistol at Arlene McNeil and pulled the trigger. The bullet hit her head, and she fell immediately to the floor. Despite her injury, she was still breathing. They ordered Donna to stay there as she watched her friend bleed out on the floor. Freeman McNeil, who was not related to Arlene McNeil, reminded his partners in crime to hurry. Muse and Wood quickly made their way upstairs into the primary area of the store. Neil Burroughs was in the kitchen, working on cleaning the sinks. He had not heard the shots fired in the basement because of the noisy hum of the restaurant, so he was ill-prepared when Wood and Muse showed up. Wood let off another round, which struck the back of Neil's head. Neil didn't understand what happened to him or why he felt weak. When Neil dropped to his knees, Muse pulled out his knife and stabbed Neil in the neck. McNeil eventually showed up and beat Neil with a shovel handle. A second round was fired from the 22 caliber gun, and that ended Neil Burrow's life. Wood went back downstairs to grab Donna Warren, who had been too terrified to move. Wood and Donna went upstairs to the area where the safe was located. They ordered her to open the safe and hand over the money. Donna complied, and when she stood up, she was hoping she could go back and help her friend Arlene. Derek Wood shot her in the back of the head. She didn't realize what happened, and she was still alive as Wood rifled through the safe and took all the money. When Wood was done, he stood up and shot Donna through the eye. Jimmy Fagan was heading to McDonald's a little early so he could hang out with the night crew before he worked his overnight shift. Jimmy was riding in his friend, Daniel McVicar's cab, and was dropped off around 1 a.m. at the backside of the store. He rang the buzzer to be let inside, and he was face-to-face with Derek Wood, who he knew a little since they had worked together before. Freeman McNeil shot Jimmy Fagan in the head, right in the basement's doorway. Wood, Muse, and McNeil stepped over Jimmy and ran off to their car. They tossed the shovel handle before they arrived at the vehicle. The cab driver, Daniel McVicar, was driving away and swore he heard a firecracker go off. When he looked back at McDonald's, he saw two people running away from the store, across the field that was next to the parking lot. He had a gut sense that something might be wrong, so he headed back to the store. He saw his friend Jimmy laying in the doorway and immediately called his dispatcher to tell him that his passenger had been harmed and asked for the RCMP and an ambulance. They instructed him to not get out of the cab in case there was danger. Daniel McVicar continued to circle McDonald's in his cab until help arrived. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt True Crime. Podcast listeners, let me tell you about Best Fiends. It's an engaging puzzle game that everyone is playing. It's a casual game that you play on your phone. I've even played it on my iPad before. Well, mostly because the eyesight ain't what it used to be. But Best Fiends keeps adding new levels and events every single month, so they keep it entertaining. It's a great game to play when I need to take a break from writing podcast scripts. And 
you don't need to be tethered to Wi-Fi because you can play without an internet connection. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends, free in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Hi everyone, I really need to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their licensed professional therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in just about anything, including anxiety, depression, family conflicts, trauma, and LGBTQ issues. I work from home and barely leave my house, so it's great that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your own home. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional in-person counseling, and financial aid is available. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states, and you can start talking with your counselor in less than 24 hours. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Now, back to the show. Wood Muse and McNeil jumped into the car and drove away. But Wood realized he left his bag in the back door of the restaurant. It was a colossal mistake. He asked to be let out of the car. Wood was going to fix this mistake and create an alibi at the same time. Back at McDonald's, another cab driver arrived at the store to help Daniel McVicar. With strength in numbers, both men got out of their taxis and ran over to check on Jimmy Fagan as he laid in the doorway. He was still alive but was in terrible shape after taking a shot to the head. They attempted to care for him, but there was not much they could do until the ambulance arrived. Wood returned to grab his bag, but he saw that the cab drivers were in the store parking lot. He was going to have to leave the pack behind, and instead changed plans. Wood walked over to a nearby convenience store. He was going to call in the crime, like he was a casual witness who had been smoking a cigarette outside the store, when he heard the gunshots. Wood used the store's phone, called in the crime, and boldly gave them his full name. He placed another call to Friedman McNeil's house, but he wasn't home yet. Ambulances arrived at McDonald's, and medical staff were making assessments. Neil Burroughs and Donna Warren could not be helped. They were deceased. Arlene McNeil and Jimmy Fagan were still hanging on. They were immediately rushed to the hospital. At the Sydney City Hospital, they determined Jimmy Fagan would not make it. Arlene was the only person who survived, but that bullet she took to the brain would leave her permanently disabled. While medical staff were working on Arlene and all the other victims' families were being called to inform them of what happened to their loved ones, Muse and McNeil were ditching evidence. They stuffed their second layer of clothes that were now bloody into a duffel bag. Then they parked not too far away from McNeil's house, walked into the woods, hid the duffel bag, and also ditched the empty shell casings from the twenty two pistol. McNeil stuffed the pistol into a cushion in the back seat of his car. Derek Wood was done making calls, and now he had no ride or way to get home. By that time, all the stores around McDonald's had been informed of the tragedy, and everything was going on lockdown. Roadblocks were being put up on the street. Wood walked up to one of the officers manning the roadblock and informed him that he was the person who had called in the incident. The officer thought Wood was behaving strangely, and he had a cut on his hand. When confronted, Wood made up a lie on the spot and said he had cut his hand a few days back, when he was opening a can. 
The officer asked Wood to come back to the station with him for an interview. Wood's interrogation began at 4.45 a.m. Detectives were not buying Derek Wood's story from the beginning. He said he was at work doing inventory. Wood went out to have a smoke and stuck his bag in the door to make sure he could get back in. He heard a shot, which scared him, so he ran off. Detectives checked the parking lot and found no cigarettes that Wood might have dropped that would verify his story. Wood also gave them another story, that he was inside McDonald's, then he actually ran away when he heard shots. They let him go after about 26 hours because they did not have enough evidence to charge him. Detectives did not bring up the fact that they knew Wood called a Freeman McNeil from the convenience store. They headed to McNeil's home to speak with him next. McNeil told them that he knew Derek Wood and that he had given him a ride to work at McDonald's at 8 p.m. on the night of the murders, but did not see him after that. McNeil told detectives he went out later that night around 1.30 a.m. to get his girlfriend's inhaler. He saw his friend Darren Muse by Tim Hortons, so he picked him up. He had seen police around the McDonald's and figured there was an accident. RCMP went to find Darren Muse, and when they questioned him, he couldn't remember what route he drove when he was in the car with McNeil to pick up the inhaler. He said that he was too preoccupied with playing with the stereo and looking at books that were in McNeil's car. They didn't buy his story and asked Muse to take a polygraph test. Muse told RCMP that he would think about it. Darren Muse went home and wrote a suicide note. He took a bunch of pills and cut his wrist. This was not so much a suicide attempt as it was a cry for help. The cut he made to his wrist was superficial, and his life was never in jeopardy. Muse did eventually take the polygraph test, but he failed. When pressed about why he failed, Muse refused to tell RCMP anything useful. Freeman McNeil was also asked to take a polygraph test, which he agreed to, but failed. They asked him to explain himself, and he told a story that would sink his two friends, Derek Wood and Darren Muse. McNeil said he picked up Muse after the murders, and Muse told him that Woods went crazy. He shot up everyone at McDonald's. McNeil delivered a story that was filled with some truths and some falsehoods, none of which implicated himself. He told the officer that Muse made him stop so he could dump evidence in the woods. RCMP knew McNeil wasn't telling the truth and had already found out he had been practice shooting with a gun the week prior to the murders. They held Freeman McNeil in custody the night of May 15th. Derek Wood had been out celebrating his birthday with his cousin, Mike Campbell, when RCMP arrested both of them. At that point, they weren't sure if Mike was involved. They released him once they verified he had nothing to do with the crime. They picked Darren Muse up last. Muse asked for a lawyer, but started talking and told police where the weapons were located. On May 16, 1992, ten days after the initiation of the crimes, they charged Derek Wood with two counts of first-degree murder and one count each of attempted murder, armed robbery, conspiracy to commit robbery, and unlawful confinement. They charged Darren Muse and Freeman McNeil with two counts of first-degree murder and one count each of armed robbery, conspiracy to commit armed robbery, and unlawful confinement. It wasn't until May 1993 that the court trials began. Derek Wood was tried first. The court was packed full of spectators. Emotions were high, with so many victims and their family members, along with the wider community, who were upset that such a senseless crime could take place in their backyard. One of the largest questions that had to be answered is which defendant committed which crime? since all the victims had passed away except Arlene McNeil. Wood's attorney claimed that, while the defendant planned the robbery, he did not take part in the shooting of any of the victims. The prosecution had based their case around Derek Wood's videotaped confession he made to RCMP on the day he was arrested. Ultimately, 
they found Derek Wood guilty on the attempted murder of Arlene McNeil. Guilty on two counts of first-degree murder of Donna Warren and Neil Burroughs, and guilty of robbery and unlawful confinement. He received three concurrent life sentences with no chance of parole for 25 years. The second trial was for Darren Mews, which started on June 7, 1993. Mews took a deal and pleaded guilty to the second-degree murder of Neil Burroughs and to armed robbery. Mews claimed he was the person who had slashed Neil Burroughs' throat in order to end his suffering, since Neil had been severely wounded, as if it was some act of kindness. The Crown dropped all other charges. This outcome was upsetting to the Burroughs family, that they would not be allowed to share their victim impact statements in court. A life sentence with no possibility of parole for 20 years was given to Darren Muse. The upset had reached such substantial proportions that Muse had to be escorted out of the courtroom by 20 officers. Freeman McNeil's trial was last, and wrapped up on October 8, 1992. They convicted him of the first-degree murder of Neil Burroughs and the second-degree murder of Jimmy Fagan. He was also found guilty of robbery and unlawful confinement. McNeil received a life sentence with no possibility of parole for 25 years. The Sydney River McDonald's was closed for about two weeks after the murders and took almost a year to return to the pre-crime profitability margins. The store was torn down in 2000 and is now an empty lot. By March 2007, Darren Muse had been working outside a minimum security prison where he was housed in Laval, Quebec. In March 2011, the parole board granted him day parole and thought it was unlikely that he would commit another crime. They fully paroled him on November 22, 2012. He was disallowed from ever going to Sydney or the surrounding area. Darren Muse moved to British Columbia. They granted Freeman McNeil escorted temporary absence in September 2016. That was 8 to 12 hours in length. In November 2019, they gave him temporary, unsecured absences from prison. Derek Wood assaulted another inmate in 1998. Sharpened toothbrushes and paintbrushes were used in that attack. He assaulted two correctional officers in 2006. Wood received one-year concurrent sentences for each incident. Wood's parole was denied in 2015, as they considered him to be a medium to high risk for violent reoffense. The sole survivor of the Sydney River McDonald's murders was Arlene McNeil. The shot she took to the brain resulted in her having a permanent disability, being wheelchair-bound, and living in a home that catered to caring for people with brain injuries. In 2018, she passed away at age 46. The three perpetrators never gave an explanation why they committed the crime. A forensic psychiatrist, who testified at one of the trials, hypothesized that the three men did not have backgrounds significant for violent crime but talked up the fact that they were big-time criminals. When they committed the robbery, they dialed up their violent actions because no one wanted to appear as if they were the weak link. They did not find money to be a motive, especially after the safe was opened. The total amount of money they took was $2,017 plus change, which was miles apart from the original amount of $200,000. For this case, it remains an unanswered question. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and music scoring were performed by me. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review in Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone.